healthcare professionals are really well placed to identify areas for improvement. They know their service and they know the sort of things that people are always talking about as being a problem. So there'll be a lot of areas where people know that resources aren't being used as well as they could be. They know that where there are some parts the service isn't really meeting patient expectations or giving people a good experience of that service and they'd like it to be better. So those are really sort of open door situations where people are aware of something that needs to be improved, it's been talked about and then coming up with an idea as to how you can work on that will really have a lot of local buy-in. In order to then bring people along with you in terms of you've identified what you want to improve and people say yes yes we know we, we can do better there and you get some enthusiasm it's really important to also think about how you can build some evidence for the solution the way you've decided to try to tackle this area for improvement because we, unless there is some evidence to back up the ideas uh, a lot of energy and time can be wasted by people debating is this the right approach what's the evidence for that. Some of that is very genuine. There is, uh, there is a cost benefit to all of this in terms of the resources of people, the energy that people have to put into making improvements. I have to say there is also sometimes a bit of a delaying tactic. If, you know, if we spend enough time forever asking what the evidence is, then we can just carry on working the way we've always had to work and we won't have to put this effort into changing. And there, there is a bit of that and people need to plan for how are they going to overcome local resistance and really take people with them uh, for their idea. So then in terms of thinking about cost benefits, this is a really difficult area and, and we're finding that local healthcare improvement teams are, um, are struggling to pull together cost benefit um, robust data. So really the way to look at this is to think about resources because it is clear what resources are being used and a lot of that is staff time so you can set out how the new way of doing things is going to take less staff time or perhaps involve different staff. We've seen a number of improvements where the emphasis has been on making sure that the most experienced member of the clinical team sees the people with the most complex and complicated cases rather than the consultant seeing everybody. So those sorts of improvements where you're, you've got to, you know what the cost of consultant time is as opposed to the cost of uh, clinical nurse specialist time and you can set it out in those sort of ways. One of the things that we have to be really clear about though is if you're talking about saving time, what do you want the saved time to be used for? and there needs to be a case for that because otherwise there isn't really an overall benefit in terms of cost benefit to the service. So that's something that needs to be really carefully thought through. And also the cost of the other resources and this is where you can sometimes show that your new way of doing things will actually result in bottom line savings if you are therefore reducing the number of medications that need to be used, the number of tests that have to be done or opting for a cheaper test instead of a more expensive one, then you can you know there's a real bottom line cost saving but that's usually quite a small proportion it's usually about saving time and then needing to be clear about where is that where is that taking you in the longer term in terms of it being a cost benefit improvement this work is not easy I mean this is the health foundation has been involved in promoting quality improvement helping frontline teams to put their improvements into place for over 10 years now and it just shows that this work is not easy and there are some simple steps which make success more likely. So part of this is being able to demonstrate the improvement through measurement. Um, and there's a lot of different ways in which people can demonstrate the quality improvement and people will be fairly well familiar with those ranging from uh, patient experience and patient satisfaction surveys through to data on utilisation of um, theatre resources um, and, and so on. So there's a lot of data that's collected and we really advise people to use existing data collection wherever they can, think about what the measures might be and what data is already collected around that because putting in additional data collection is very burdensome and it's a real turn off for staff. If they feel that is a real burden and you can, you can explain how much the benefit is going to be in terms of how much better the service will be, but it is real extra work for people. So where there's an existing data collection, you know, do use that, but with a warning that you need to 
extract that data for your local measurement at source because again the experience has been that people have found it incredibly difficult to get their data back once it's been gone into a, a trust-wide program or sent off for a national data collection it's really really hard to get that data back and then people are having to recreate it um, and another key step around the data is do a baseline data capture before you start any of your change intervention because you can never recapture that baseline data and then again really hard to show that, that what you've changed um, has has resulted uh, in the improvement that, that you're claiming so that that's I mean, I can't spend you know, people will know what their suitable measures will be uh, and they will be different for whatever the, the project is in terms of cost data the experience we found from frontline clinical teams is it incredibly difficult to disentangle and isolate the cost data for their part of a service um, so really concentrate on resources you can be very clear about what resources you're using and measure those accurately and, and leave other people to work out what the cost of that is um, if you can get some expert input and, uh, and have a health economist to do a cost benefit study, I mean, that's, that's brilliant. Um, but would really say probably don't try to do too much of that locally without some expert help, because uh, it just can be very frustrating. The quality, quality improvement movement has only recently looked at cost, because this was not the lens through which we were looking at this work uh, pre before the last sort of four or five years. Um, but it's, it's now very important to be aware of how much the current service costs and how much or what resources you are using in your, in your changed way of, of operating your service. Because without, without that argument of showing that you're making better use of the resources, it's really unlikely that you'll be able to um, bring top management, service managers along with you, because that is the question everybody is asking, is how much is this going to cost and, and what's the cost benefit going to be? So people have to be very mindful of that. And, and particularly, I think, bringing other members of staff with you. Um, it's great that people have these big ideas and they're, they're really committed to it and they have a vision as to how they're going to improve the service. But it's really, really important to bring all the members of the immediate staff team along with you and also communicate across the organisation so that other people are aware of what is happening and, and how what you're changing then may impact on other parts of the service, uh, you know, upstream or downstream in the patient's journey. So a lot of communication really important and to, to think through the ideas and how much how much time and, and effort from people it is going to take to put this in place and, and have that sort of mapped out fairly well as well as you can before you start uh, i think that'd be more more likely to be successful some of the major challenges and the common challenges that come up time and again are uh, about the need for project management uh, to make the change happen and again if someone's had a great idea and they're the lead clinician for their team it's usually a good idea to have some project management time from somebody else as well um, I think we've found that it that, that that will again will enable success in that uh, a senior person can have the overview and get other people alongside for that idea but in terms of the day-to-day -day implementation it really needs some dedicated time so that that is very important in terms of moving away from improvement projects and thinking about how we can have sustainable improvement it's very important that people think about the organizational processes and how what they're changing is going to fit into those and some of the success stories we've seen have been where people have put a lot of effort into getting their clinical protocols done gone through all the right channels um, and have got a written procedure and a business case for what it is that they're changing and then if it does prove to be successful they've really got the building blocks in place already for it to become the way we do things around here and, and sort of lose that project status and I think that's probably another thing I'd mention is the the double-edged nature of of doing things as a project 
on the one hand it's really good because you get some uh, input from people because it's a project and so they commit to it so you get some of their time you may be able to get some project funding and that's all very good the downside is that it is seen as being something apart from the day-to-day -day work and then there is this difficulty of trying to integrate that into everyday practice.